I'm Jan McCready from Jan McCready Urban Design. Um, I believe that strategic design is absolutely essential in placemaking and in, in developing our cities and it's essential because it's the only way of dealing with the three-dimensional entities of the city in terms of space, land and built form. It's essential because it leads to what goes in as all the hard infrastructure and that hard infrastructure, particularly the street systems, are there for hundreds and hundreds, of, sometimes thousands of years and they're the basis of our city. So we need a design process that enables that to happen in an effective, robust way. I manage a small team in uh, RMS and we, um, we're responsible for um, the urban design policy, so how we, um, how we design roads, streets, motorways, highways. And I think the important thing to remember is that there are lots of different types of thoroughfares, lots of different types of roads. Some of them are, are streets in heavy built up areas, others are highways through the landscape, motorways, lanes, so there's a whole myriad of different uh, road types and each of them needs to be thought about as both a linkage for transport and a place in its own right. Um, so roads in cities go through town centres and they are streets and places for people to live but highways and motorways are also places where people spend a lot of time and experience the landscape so that's our sort of approach to make, make sure RMS understands this dual role and designs our roads and streets appropriately. So my name's Kylie Legg, I'm the Director of Place Partners and I guess for me being a placemaker and placemaking is all about making better um, generally urban environments, the public spaces, the spaces, the shared, I guess, city aspects, um, better for people. I think in many cases placemaking, uh, the difference from, I guess, one of the sort of single professions like urban design or architecture is that we don't assume what the tool is that you need to solve a particular problem, nor do we necessarily assume what the problem is. So through a placemaking process, it's all about researching the local context and understanding what's working and what doesn't work, and then actually identifying what the appropriate tool is for fixing that problem, or at least trying, attempting to kind of resolve it. So that if you have a security problem, it might not be about putting in CTV cameras or about sort of even a design solution. It might be more about the social equity of the space or inviting different people to use the space or manage, uh, obviously, the people. So it's a social issue, not a design issue as such. Hi, um, my name's Helen Laverty, so I'm the Roads Place Manager for the City of Canada Bay Council. And you've asked me to talk very briefly about some lessons um, that we've learnt from placemaking. I think there's an ongoing challenge um, when working with both new and existing communities um, and making place and creating a sense of place. Um, the biggest challenges that we've learnt as an organisation is being able to manage um, the differences between resources available, the time to implement projects and um, the opportunity or the lack of opportunity for engagement for different kinds of stakeholders and also that ongoing challenge of getting different disciplines to work together towards a shared goal. I'm Marla Guppy, I'm an independent uh, cultural planner and public art curator. I've got a firm that's been going for 20 years in Sydney called Guppy and Associates. I, I think placemaking has been a really important thing that's happened, a way of thinking that's happened over the last 20 years and I think it's resulted in some, some very exciting interchanges. But I think we're at a point where, where we need to understand that it isn't one size fits all, that cities are complicated and that there are complicated interactions between people and place and that that relationship varies and it has subtle textures and layerings in different areas. And I think we need a level of real, um, prof both professional intelligence, but also creative intelligence to, to bring that into our work. Uh, I'm Tim Williams, I'm Chief Executive of the Committee for Sydney. And I have a background in trying to make places, uh, actually. So I have a very strong belief that we need to understand the economic fundamentals. Cities exist because of their economic offer. They draw, that drives cities. Cities without economic offers die but they also dictate the shape of cities. And I think too often the discussion on placemaking is about skills rather than the, the drivers and motors of places. And I want to bring these two things together again. I've borrowed from Christopher Alexander his terms self-conscious and unselfconscious. Um, self-conscious urban design is when you have professionals um, setting up a vision on behalf of somebody and then carrying it through to solution. Unselfconscious process of urban design is when um, everybody is a designer and they're designing um, without sort of professional um, content, but 
um, based on their own experiences and based on their own motivations. This is very similar to the informal versus formal um, that we've just um, listened to. That, in fact, both informal and, and formal are both sets of developers, um, but have a very, very different focus. Um, that the formal tends to be the, the large scale self conscious design um, with a big S and a big C, and the informal tends to be the also self-conscious, but done piece by piece without very clear uh, end objective in mind. I've borrowed the term affordance from James Gibson, who was on my doctoral committee at Cornell. Um, and I think that professional groups can be broken down into a couple of components at least. And one group has become much more self-conscious about the affordances of uh, built form for a variety of people, ranging from young to old, from the able-bodied to the less able-bodied, um, and dealing with different cultural groups. Um, and the, the other group seems to still be fascinated by the geometry of places um, for its own sake. They're interested in the formal aesthetics of it rather than what it affords uh, affords people. So yes, I think some urban designers have become very, very self-conscious. And the example that I showed of Jamison Square, which was designed by an internationally renowned uh, landscape architect, Peter Walker, um, shows the real consideration for the young, for the old, for family groups, um, for individuals. Um, so um, I think some uh, urban designers, okay. landscape architects, have become very, very sensitive to the range of affordances in different climates and different uh, cultural zones. And others seem to neglect it all and simply think of uh, the built environment as an art form where they can express their own likes and dislikes. I'm Kate Shaw from the University of Melbourne. I think that almost invariably informal practices of placemaking are more interesting and engaging than formal practices of placemaking. And it's a little bit like art. The most interesting art is always the, the, the forbidden art and, and the, the unauthorised. Uh, you see it in the streets. The, the, the street art, the imagination, the things that happen when they're not expected that make you laugh in the course of your day walking down a street. Uh, I mean they're the moments that they're, they're the moments that define us, that make us human, that make us engage with the place, that make us love being alive. The problem with formal place making practices is that it, it tends to dampen that and I'm not sure that that impulse, that human impulse can be controlled. Which is then not to say that I don't think that we should try to control or shape places. I do think that there is a role for place making, but I think we just have to have a very strong sense of our lack of real ability to control and the importance of creating conditions for what and whom. And they're the really key questions. My name's Tim Williams, I'm an architect. I work with councils, government authorities and help do uh, place making visions for, for, for large areas of the city or smaller areas of the city. One of the projects that I was working on last year is called Super Sydney, which was a metropolitan wide conversation with people from across the whole metropolis of all ages, all cultural backgrounds, on what was important to them about the future of the city of Sydney, what places they valued, what places they had concerned about or what issues they had concerns about, what um, uh, dreams they had for the city and what actions they'd be prepared to take to help make things change. One of the responses to the first question to what places they valued most in the city was apart from the landscape and access to it were places where people came together and celebrated and one of the places that people identified very strongly was Darling Harbour and that's people from as far away as Penrith, Campbelltown, Auburn, Sutherland, Pittwater, Mossman, a lot of people from across the whole metropolis really value Darling Harbour. And I have a fear that with the new designs for Darling Harbour that we have seen uh, emerge recently uh, through a very private and non-public process, that there seems to be a, a wholesale loss of a lot of the richness and grain of what people have 
been accustomed, become accustomed to in terms of a place to come. It's a very democratic place. People feel welcome. It's not overly um, fancy. And I think that those are qualities which we mustn't underestimate. And uh, as w designers or uh, people with a certain uh, uh, aesthetic uh, education, we can often uh, presume to uh, know what's right in a place. Whereas in fact, if we listen to what is essentially a metropolitan place, listen to what people think is important about this place, which is important to people across the whole metropolis, then we can start to inform our ideas about what we should be doing with this place. And um, there, there are examples around the world where this uh, mistake has been made and then gone back to. For example, in Paris at Leal, a project was done in consultation with the people around Leal, which is right in the centre of Paris, a very busy uh, railway station area and they came up with a design and they realised that they'd made a huge mistake because Leal wasn't just important to the people who lived around there, it was important to people from all around the metropolis of Paris. And so they completely redesigned it and, and came up with something which uh, uh, addresses issues and makes a far richer, more interesting project which allowed for the growth and the development that would needed to happen there. And I think we should be doing the same thing here in Darling Harbour and those conversations haven't occurred yet. The inspiration is that I've, I've got a music degree, so I've always been really interested in sound and how it, how it affects us. Um, so my inspiration then is thinking about our connection to place and how we constitute, how we're connected to place, how we're connected to each other and how sound may influence those interactions we have with place. Um, theoretically, I was really interested in reading a jazz musician's book about improvisation. And that's what really got me thinking about how we can attach effect and music and sound to place. And it was Ingrid Monson, and um, she got jazz musicians to improvise and then asked them what are they doing, what were they feeling, why did they improvise in the way they did. And I thought that's a really fascinating way to get people to think about what they're doing, perhaps unconsciously, um, pre-consciously in their, in their place and how they're interacting with others. I think it's great that people are starting to think about sound a lot more. Um, we're very we're very adept at reading visual, visual cues, um, recognising what things mean through, through vision and less so through sound. Um, and for me sound's very interesting because uh, my understanding is um, the way we process sound in the brain is very closely connected to effect and emotion. So there's that, that interesting interaction I think going on when we're hearing. So I think it's wonderful that um, people are starting to think about the significance of sound and, and what it means to us in our everyday lives. So I was, I was really pleased with, with the comments. I'm Fiona Rabay from Fiona Rabay Landscape Architects. We design almost exclusively for children in the work that we do and that's right across Australia. It's sound along with a whole lot of other sensory inputs that are important to people that we consult with. And that comes through for us, it's, it's about children and what they're saying about place. And for them, sound is built into the experience of place very powerfully. And we hear about that because they'll say things like, I like to hear the birds in the trees, or I don't like to hear noisy traffic. So we hear that it's embedded in their experience. It's, it's not separate for them because they live their lives so very immediately. Um, that's what's beautiful about kids. They live right here and now and they live very powerfully through their senses and very powerfully through social interaction. Um, and both of those have a soundscape that go with them. How do we design for this is actually really easy because we listen carefully to what people and children are telling us and we have quite a lot of analysis of that and we realise the things that they like listening to, we realise the things they don't like listening to and we start translating that into design. If kids don't like having a noisy motorway nearby a place where they're playing, we make sure we select a site that's not near a, r a busy roadway. Um, if kids like, and they do, like listening to birds in trees, we make sure we're in a treed environment. If the trees aren't there, we plant them. This is, again, it's easy. Um, what we find is because both the social experience is important to kids and the sensory experience. You design for social outcomes and you design for sensory outcomes very consciously. 
and soon it becomes, for me, very automatic actually. You're always designing in a way that brings out that richness. So a swing is not just a swing, it's a swing surrounded by a little grove of trees. Um, there might be rocks, there might be, water, there might be a water feature. You can very consciously bring these elements into the, the, the kind of design that you do. Um, and kids will relate to it powerfully and they won't realise, oh I like that swing because I can hear water or I can hear birds. It's just built into their concept of place and the concept of themselves and if they can talk to other people about that experience that they're having, it's very powerful for them. Very powerful as, as um, memory and building those happy memories of being in special places. It's easy to do. <laughs> I'm Linda Corkery, I'm an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Built Environment and the Director of the Landscape Architecture Program and an active member of the People in Place Research Cluster. I've been working really closely with Kate on the planning for today's session and we're really delighted with the way it's all come together. We had um, some blue sky exciting ideas about the people we wanted to bring together and we've had um, the list of invitations that we've been pondering over for the months and finally sent them out, got the responses back and the people who've come today are really the people we wanted to have in the room. It's been a really lively discussion, everybody's had lots of good responses to the keynote speakers. I think our keynote speakers also have had a nice relationship to one another in terms of the topics they've been covering. And that that's really something you don't know is going to happen until the day it happens. And we know we knew a little bit about each of their research backgrounds and the papers they've written and so on. But to have them come together and put together a public presentation um, and have it all meld together so beautifully has been really fantastic. So I think there's a good vibe in the room. We've got good respondents, so we chose our attendees very wisely, I think, in terms of people that engaged and thought about what they were hearing and had um, a good way of synthesizing the information and, and really reflecting on it in a productive way. So uh, all in all, a fantastic uh, cluster event from our perspective and one that we'll look to see if we can repeat in the near future.